This is a recording for the COPAP project, Coastal Uplands Heritage and Tourism. My name is Daniel Carey. Today is the 28th of July, 2023, and I have with me here, Karen Codd. Thank you, Karen. Can you confirm for the recorder that you're happy to take part in this project? I am. And could you spell your name for the recorder, please? K-A-R-E-N-C-O-D-D. -D. Lovely. Um, I thought we might start with um, your early memories of um, of life in the in the Black Stairs region. What um, what comes to mind? Wow. Okay. Um, well, I'm one of five children. Um, my parents are Martin and Margaret. Um, both Ratnior people. My mum is uh, Margaret Murphy from Ratduff. My dad Martin Cod from Askin Farney Ratnior. Um, my dad was a foreman at the time I was born and I was born actually in Nace um, or they were living in Nace, I was born in Dublin um, and then my sister Jolene who's a year younger than me was born in Waterford and I'm not sure exactly when but shortly after that we um, went down to Kerry to Tralee where my dad was working um, on Kerry Co-op um, the building of Kerry Co-op at the time so before I was in national school, before we started national school, um, we moved back home to Rathnure. Um, my parents had a house in Carrigeen and uh, when we moved home we lived in a caravan for, I don't know how long, I suppose it was probably for about a year. Um, and uh, I remember, I remember a few, a few very specific memories. One is my aunt Agnes, who would be my dad's sister. Um, coming up to visit and she had presents for us all of course and she had a dress for me which was called a granny grunt dress so for a long time afterwards it was always are you wearing your granny grunt dress um i have another memory of singing the rising of the moon and daddy recording us playing the guitar just inside the door of the caravan so there was two steps coming up into the caravan and as far as I remember, um, when you came in the door on the left hand side was where we slept. Um, I think it must have been um, a table or something or, you know, kind of a, a seating area during the daytime. And there was a counter kind of dividing that and maybe the kitchen area. And I remember the recorder was on that and it was a, one of those spool tape recorder ones. And uh, myself and Jolene who's a year younger, and Idal, who's three years older, older than me, we sang the, the Rising of the Moon. And I remember hearing it at different times over the years, and it's just, it's, it's just a really funny memory to remember, because I remember it happening, and I remember hearing it years and years later. Um, I also remember around the time then, when we moved into the house, my mum and dad, um, it was a... a, a I suppose what you'd call a two up two down cottage and um it was built into like they extended it and added on um bedrooms for us all and the whole lot so i remember as far as i remember when my brother martin was born um he would be three years younger than me he was born i believe we were already after moving into the house at that stage so i think i was about four when we moved home because I started school, I started national school in Ratnior. So, yeah, so they're my earliest memories. I remember in the house then, when we were living in the house, I remember there was a few things I really remember. I remember there was a massive snowstorm. Um, I remember, I think it was 87 for some reason. I could be wrong now, whatever year there was a, a massive snowstorm. and. I remember coming out the front door and our, our front door was kind of up a few steps from the yard and we had to kind of climb up in the snow and while we were out standing in the snow I remember mum or dad telling us that we were actually standing on the roof of the car that we, the snow was that deep I remember there was a track made down to the outside of our gate as such and there was a stream running down on the far side of the road outside the gate and I remember that was where um, we used to get water because obviously the pipes and all were frozen so there was water 
and uh, we used to have our tea and everything um, made over the fire um, and toast I remember toast being made quite a bit as well mum used to make loads of scones when we were small as well they were always good and I remember that particular winter I remember dad and one of our neighbours um, Jim Cooney um, walking to I don't remember was it Eileen Rhines or to our Uncle Vincent's shop in Ratnure and they got like whatever provisions were needed um, Jim was living um, in the house above us which was at the Tea of Corrigan, um with his mum and dad at the time and they were they were elderly um, and I remember they seemed to be gone forever and I remember them coming up as far as I can remember they went down the road like they were digging a, to a roadway or they were digging a pathway down the road but for some reason I remember them coming up what seemed to be over <laughs> over the ditch at the bottom of the what we call the acre which is basically our, our garden or our lawn area and uh, I remember them coming up over that ditch which makes no sense at all because it's a very high ditch on the other side which would have been down into Teddy O'Connor's field um, we there was a big drop down like we were always warned not to be on that ditch uh, which of course meant nothing to us we were always climbing trees on it anyway um, so yeah a few kind of funny memories like that then I also remember I remember playing Harlan all the time we just seemed to be playing Harlan and riding bikes um, we used to race each other over the over Cargain Lane over towards the mountain it was what we called the little hill and then there was the big hill and we used to race each other and time each other so this is myself and my brothers and sisters and at some stage we started to doubt each other's times so we used to stand on the back ditch when man wasn't looking <laughs> and we used to be able to see the top of the hill the big hill so we'd know then if somebody actually went to the top of the big hill and uh, we'd be able to see each other then and it was always a race myself and Jolene were only a year apart well I suppose we still are only a year apart but uh, we we basically you know we we were kind of the same stage of growing up all the time um, so I remember being probably a little bit more competitive with her maybe than I would have been with Edel. Um, uh, yeah so lots of good memories I remember my uncle Willie who was my mum's brother and my aunt Teresa um, they were both living um, with my granny Murphy in Rat Duff at the time and I remember Willie and granny and Teresa used to walk up from Rat Duff to us like up over the mountains up over up through Newtown over the Scunce and on up into into Rat Newer. so t Willie used to come up nearly every Sunday and he used to play the whistle um, he used to have this habit of coming up and he'd kind of just stand at the window with just his head peering in up over it almost like a flower pot and he used to frighten the life out of mommy every single week she'd laugh and he'd, he'd roar laughing and he could never understand why she always got a fright when he did it um, but Willie spent many hours playing Harlem with us um, Teresa um, as well and they had, they had two dogs sometimes they came up on their bikes and they used to bring the dogs with them and uh, we spent many hours then looking for Harlem balls that were after going into the, the ditches. We used to go into the fields. We were only allowed into the fields if there wasn't animals in them. Um, there was one time um, Teddy had cattle in the field below us and he had a bull with them. And I can't remember, for some reason, I think maybe the cow the cows were gone and just the, um, the bullock, he was a young bull like in the field and uh, Mammy was away, she must have been in town or something, and Daddy was at home with us. Um, but I think he might have been over with the road working. There was a house that was being done up at the time, and I think he was over there. Um, I can't really remember, but I don't think Daddy was there. I think it was the three girls, were, we were the ones that were at home, and I think Dad came back. But anyway, in the meantime, um, another neighbour of ours was bringing up young heifers up the road, and the bullock basically just went mental just went mad and leapt out over ditches and stuff and uh, we had been in a field we weren't supposed to be in and Teddy and Johnny always you know let mammy know when there was a bull in and you know kind of said to us don't go into it like you know but of course that didn't mean anything to us as children but 
we went into a field and uh, while we were in this field the cow or the bullock jumped over got over one of the ditches and was obviously you know following the the heifers that were going up on the other side of the it there was a field kind of between him and the other and the road where the heifers were being brought and we had a bike with us in the field so i don't know what we were doing but i remember we ran down the field and climbed into another field and then climbed into the quarry which was below kind of the brow of the hill or the brow of Corrigan. and then i remember daddy coming home in the jeep i don't i honestly don't remember where he was or even if he was away maybe my memory of that side of it isn't very good but he had martin um our oldest younger brother with him and uh he he told martin to stay in the jeep because he had heard us like we shouted to him to tell him what was happening and he told us to stay where we were because we couldn't get to him because the the bullock was or the, yeah the bullock was in the field so he went in and i think he must have rang um teddy to come up and uh I just remember being very, very afraid. I remember just thinking, oh my God, we're never going to get home and you know, the bull is going to kill us. Like, But of course the bull had no interest in us whatsoever. Um, but my, <laughs> my brother Martin climbed out the window of the car, out of the, the Jeep, and he fell and he actually split his lip open. I remember did he lose a tooth as well, but he, he but yeah, so there was lots of injuries that day. But yeah, I do remember that as well, so. Yeah, so in generally speaking, like we were, I suppose, up to development, very active, very out and running around, a lot of music, a lot of hurling and um, building ramps and things. We used to cycle, um, make ramps in the yard and cycle up and then mum was building a rockery at the time in the garden and we used to, to go up the rockery on the bike and kind of do these half turns at the top of it and come back down then. And we just seemed to be spending hours and hours doing that during our school, our school holidays. So yeah, good. Gotcha. Good There's a times. lot of, lot of, Lots of things happen. Now they are my things. only memories. <laughs> and, and, and things we might, a couple of things we might, um, yeah. we might come back to there. But um, mm. yeah, you. Um, what are your memories of school then? School. I remember. I remember my first day of school. Um, I remember going in, and Jolene was coming in. Um, with mum obviously mum was bringing us in I guess daddy must have brought her down as well like because we had only one car but anyway I remember going into school I don't know where Edel was um Edel was a couple of years older and always probably a little bit more independent than than I was um but I remember going in and Jolene crying because I was going to school um so I I don't remember I think I sat um in class maybe beside Agnes O'Gorman I think might have been the first person I sat beside in school I don't really remember um and I knew my cousins obviously Paul Codd and Dylan Codd um they were in the same class as me um I don't think I really oh and Jenny O'Connor she would have been a, a kind of a second cousin I guess so I would have remembered I would have known Jenny as well but I wouldn't have known anybody else in school um yeah I remember there was, I think there was 41 of us in class, 40 or 41 of us, yeah, we were, we were quite a big class, so, um, and I remember, yeah, we obviously had the same teacher for the year, and, you know, um, I liked school, I think I liked school, um, we did a lot of, um, I liked art stuff, and I liked, obviously, the music side of it as well, but, um, yeah, I do, I remember, I remember, um, the projectors we used to have these projectors with Irish stories in Irish that we'd have to roll on um I remember writing essays and our news of course we all had to do our news on a Monday morning this is what you did over the weekend this is what we did over the weekend our news today is Monday it is a whatever kind of a day yeah and uh used to have a prayer maybe first thing in the morning and after after lunch break I think as well uh, when we were in sixth class we used to do the rosary um, or the angelus was it the angelus maybe at 12 o'clock I think it might have been the angelus not the rosary um, but obviously that had a long lasting impression on me I can't even remember which one it was but yeah so that's that's kind of what I remember at school and what about secondary school then? secondary school I went to the FCJ in Montclody um, Edel 
um, my older sister was already in the FCJ um, and um, when I started I like nobody from Ratnior went to the FCJ so I went on my own I sat beside a girl called Margaret Byrne who still remains one of my best friends to this to this day she's um uh, she's from Kilrush and uh, yeah secondary school was um very interesting I had um um I had a real interest in sport I had an interest in history and English and art and music so all of those things were very much um encouraged and kind of you were encouraged to do your best in them in in the FCJ we had um we had uh, Grod Grant was our music teacher. Grod was um, he was very involved with the national um, youth orchestra, um, and we had um, music teachers from um, the national concert orchestra who would have been um, music teachers for us in the FCJ. Um, as well as Grant, so if you were learning an instrument, which I did because I was part of the school orchestra, I played trumpet. I don't anymore. And um, Jolie and my sister played trumpet. Idel, my older sister, played the flute. Justin, my youngest brother, he played the saxophone. Um, so I had um, you had a great uh, I had a great uh, secondary school in terms of you know drawing out interests like that I had a, a very good art teacher called Sister Helen she was one of the FCJ sisters I think she was only the the only teaching sister left when oh no no she wasn't she was this there was one of two teaching sisters when when I was in school Sister Madeline was also um, my English and history teacher she later became the the principal of the school um, and uh, we had lots of I played hockey, I played camogie. Um, Rory Kinsla, who later um, trained the Wexford senior hurling team, uh, was my was my um, one of my sports teachers. As was uh, Katrina Caulfield, um, another wonderful um, sports teacher. She she um, she um, she was a very good hockey coach, um, and. Uh, so yeah, art history, I suppose. Um, Mr. O'Neill was my history teacher. He was unbelievable. He was <laughs> he was very he really knew how to get your interest. Um, we used to call him the buzzer. I have no idea why. <laughs> and uh, yeah, just you know, it was um, it was a long day. Like we we started school. We were we used to get the bus from Kiltili, so we get the bus from Kiltili, and the bus would bring us to Rap to Bunclody, and then go back for a second round of children, like so, do a second route. So we seem to be in school from very early, um, and then, um, in the evening time, we usually did orchestra, um, after school, um, or maybe study. We did it was kind of study hall on at different times as well. We we might have done studying after school. Um, I did German at one stage which was after school as well and if you had matches or anything on you could be home late from, from that so um, sometimes we didn't actually get the bus home we waited in the school like for, for dad to collect us and dad usually collect us after work so we could be there six, half six depending on, on what was going on or where he was working at the time So, um, but yeah no it was good I, I had a, a, a big group of friends in school um, most of whom I'm I'm still in in contact with and are great friends to this day. So, yeah, very happy school. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um. Yeah. There's, there's, I'm sure there's <laughs> material we'll we come back to there as well. But um, how would you how would you describe the area to someone who hadn't um who hadn't been in it? Um, Ratnior, I think one of the biggest things in Ratnior is Harlan. Harlan and Camogie are absolutely to the core of anybody living in Ratnior they really really are um, um, like my parents are both from Ratnior um, their parents um, were from Ratnior you know so I'm, I'm very much a, a Ratnior person my mum's mum was from Inniscorty, um, but my my dad's parents both went to school in Ratnior 
um my my um my mum's um father as far as i remember he was in school in ratnior although he may have been in school in, in kiltili um but certainly i know they used to come to mass in ratnior when they were younger um when mum was younger she was going to school in kiltili and, and went to mass and everything in kiltili but um for me growing up harlan was a hugely important thing and camogie was a hugely important thing um when i was in national school i remember ratnior at the time were very successful in senior harlan um, and i had so many uncles on the team my if i try and remember them now i'm sure i hope i don't miss anybody out but i had um joe and john on my mom's side so that would have been joe murphy and john murphy um and on my dad's side i had pat and john and mike and um then their first cousins um vincent reddy Vin reddy and um david cod um he'd be tom's son uh they were you know so th- i grew up with harlan not only seeing the team but it was very much part of the family and part of the family conversations um at the same time i had my my aunts and cousins um and ready um should be second second cousin should be my dad's cousin Anne and geraldine and his sister jacqueline were hugely successful camogie players um um all played for the county um all played in all irelands um so i had an influence from both the Harlan side and the Camogie side and I think that was very very important for us um, and we never we never really oftentimes Camogie players don't get the same level of credit as as um, Harlers do and I don't think that was the case with with us I think certainly from um, my certainly from my um, my you know the cod side of the family um because there was so many camogie players we we as as young girls coming up had somebody to look up to you know um i as far as i remember my aunt agnes um was one of the founder members of the camogie club in ratnior as well um which i only found out years and years and years later um so yeah they would have been you know harlan was a great a great um it was always a match on. It was always a match to go to. I remember going to many matches in Wexford Park and in Ratnior and all over the county when we were younger. Um, and music was another huge thing that was important to our family. Maybe not so much in the wider um, Ratnior community, as in there wasn't maybe as much music being played. Um, but my dad and my granddad would have had, um, they would have played together in a, in a, in a band when when my dad was younger um and then as myself and my sister jolene um were in our teens i suppose and starting to learn to sing ourselves and you know we sang a lot with my dad and my granddad um at concerts my dad and my sister and myself jolene and myself we used to sing a lot in pubs like as we were growing up um which was kind of a nice way to earn little bit of pocket money we used to buy um keyboards and things like that with it so yeah it was good um yeah i suppose just harlan was a, a major major thing for for the community for for certainly as i was growing up it was a major thing in the community now as i'm getting older and i'm i've come back into ratnior because i was away for a number of years i realized that harlan is only one of a number of things that go on in ratnior but i probably wasn't as exposed to them um as i was growing up there was a, a big pantomime society um i would have done a lot of kind of musical musicals and stuff with them as we were growing up um tops of the towns stuff like that um but as we were teenagers and in secondary school a lot of the activities that we would have done outside of kind of school would have still been involved with the school um jolene and myself went to um we went to london to new york and boston with the school orchestra um so they were were big things for us um we did a lot of concerts not did a lot of we we did some concerts in in um the national concert hall in dublin and stuff as well so it would have been big you know musical theater as well in in the school there was always a a, a, i think it was every second year we did a, a musical play um and then 
the alternative year was um, a, a play. So we did a musical one year and the following year then we would have done a, a play. So um, we had um, Pat Connachton, um, who would have been, as far as I remember, I could be wrong with this, but I believe Pat had an involvement with the original founding members of the Druid Theatre in Galway. So he would have been our, he would have been my um, English teacher in school and uh, he would have certainly been one of the driving forces behind the the theatre side or the, the plays that went on in the FCJ as well. So, okay. yeah, busy, busy, yeah, I suppose yeah, is how absolutely. I would describe it, yeah. Um, have, you a, have you a favourite place in the area? Um, in Ratnior, I do. Um, we spent a lot of Sundays um, over actually on the mountain. Um, from the time we were very, very young, my mum um, used to bring us over to the mountain on a Sunday and we'd go, usually with picnics. I remember my Granny Murphy um, often came with us. We used to walk up to different areas on the mountain, but there's one patch as you're going up, um, say towards Cahir's Den, and it's a big white stone. And uh, we used to walk up there and we'd rest there. We might have a, a small picnic there. Um, other times we just went maybe over as far as um, what we call O'Connell's because it was O'Connell's owned it when we were younger um, and there's a, a, a kind of a stream that runs down, Mr Boro actually runs down um, and uh, there was a kind of a flat area in front of that and we used to uh, spend a bit of time there and just generally splashing around in the water or you know going up the hill picking frockings was a big thing um, so yeah I always feel kind of centred I suppose or a little bit grounded when I'm on the mountain you know so and there's such a fantastic view from the mountain um it was uh yeah, yeah. just describe what you what you see or what when, when you're when you're painting that picture what, what comes into your mind's eye that's funny there's um a lot of people who come in who go up to the mountain from New York would go up Ballybawn Lane and would go up um through the forestry maybe up to the meeting and then carry on from there but we always went over from our house which is at the tea of Cargain, and go over the road um to where the road ends basically which is on the bottom of the mountain and we'd walk we'd either walk kind of towards the meeting um or we'd head straight up like i don't want to say straight up but kind of a we didn't head over to the meeting we, we just basically went straight up to the top of the mountain from there there's a few big outcrops of rock at the very top of it and you sit on the top of those and like you just just almost like a sheer drop down into Carlo and the Carlo side of it um but looking back from the back towards the Wexford side it was always fascinating to see because you could see all the hills like you know you'd see um Outer Hill and you'd see um Carrick Burn and Bree Hill and you know um from our home actually from our front what we called our dining room window when we were younger which was you know the house has been slightly um uh, changed now but um we used to we used to see the the boats coming in in Ross Lair. so you'd see the ferries coming in and you'd see the sun shining on them we used to see the salty islands from home um, still can see the salty islands there there was a time when we couldn't because there was forestry grown but that has since been cut so we can see it now again um yeah there's a, like a few different memories of it i remember um i remember camping on the mountain a few times we actually walked from from home all the way up along what would become the wicklow way up to Marley Park in Dublin when we were teenagers, mum and dad and brought the whole lot of us on a, a walking holiday up there. And for that, we walked over to the end of the road and we, we kind of turned to our uh, to to our right, I suppose, and we headed off over towards Caluntra and down um, over Scallow Gap and then up Mount Leinster. Um, but for the most part, we, we would have just gone what I call straight up the mountain. And... Uh, yeah, I have lots of memories of Granny Murphy coming with us on those, and um, it's probably my yeah, f picking frockings and just playing hide and seek, and you know, taking off the shoes and socks and splashing about in the water, and always, always, always believing we could swim in the water, even though it was only 
maybe halfway up your shin you know always feeling that it was deep enough to swim in it like and not really wanting to hear mommy when she was saying no no it's too shallow you won't swim in it like you know but uh yeah that's that's kind of what i remember i remember um there's very little uh there's very little like when you're when you're on the mountain there's an awful lot of um uh ferns and kind of bracken and a few areas where there's quite a lot of rocks and everything on it but it's quite an open landscape you know so i often the feeling i think like when i'm thinking of it and i'm thinking of it now what i can feel is i can feel the wind blowing my hair I can actually feel the wind blowing <laughs> the hair off the back of my neck like so i don't know if that's because it was windy or because i spent a lot of my time running on the mountain i don't know but that's what i remember that's okay. the feeling i get okay. from it um how has the area changed you mentioned that you spent you spent mm -hmm. time away did anton did anton strike you when you when you came back there was there was different or um yeah there's a few things like obviously you come back as a you know you're you're slightly older than you were when you left so you come back with different pair of eyes i suppose but i suppose in terms of the 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 lane way like we live in Carrigeen, and there was a lot of houses had been built or were being built or a lot of like the coonies had passed away um um Sil Nolan and Jack Healy had passed away. Um, Caulfields were were the Caulfields were quite elderly and uh, the Morrissey's were quite elderly at the time and you know they passed away. So things like that happened that the you know there was a changing of who was living in the houses and new houses were being built. Um, and uh, yeah, that was probably a big change. But then also things like um the laneway itself changed it was uh, concreted um so when i was small it was always a, a narrowish laneway with um you know it had grass grown up the center of it. it was a really quaint little laneway i suppose um full of uh, primroses um blackberries um lots and lots of wild flowers we used to pick flowers going to school and coming home from school um so uh that was kind of changed I suppose in one degree um you know it, it became like when I was growing up um the council used to cut the 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 hedges or the the, the ditches with slash hooks um when I came back it was cut with machinery you know so suddenly there wasn't the big tall grasses the big rushes um beside the beside the the um the stream anymore um and uh, that was probably one of the biggest changes physically to it. Um, I suppose we we weren't as close to the to new neighbours as we would have been maybe to older neighbours, probably because things just move on. And you know, you when you're when you're you know when my mom and dad were raising children, our neighbours were raising children, so naturally we'd be all in school together and stuff like that. And and then you know. You, you you don't know the new neighbors because you don't have children in the same class as them or whatever so um but i think over covid and everything all of that changed or started to change again we we got um to know some of our neighbors because you know know them better because we were all walking the roads again you know um other things that changed i suppose like just even simple things like our our own garden changed my mom did an awful lot of work um building um building walls and um uh, rockeries and literally laying um flagstones and patios and stuff my mom built most of the the stone walls around our home even though my dad's the stonemason so <laughs> that was the that's the funny thing i have lots and lots of memories of mammy with the wheelbarrow and um pushing great big stones from like one end of the garden to the other and um building up um, planting up lots of flowers and stuff and headers and stuff and my grandmother no matter where she was if she she came across a plant that she liked or whatever or somebody gave her a slip she'd literally just stick it in the ground and it would grow so we've lots of um granny's flowers and stuff are still in in the garden that mom and herself would have sown um so the the over the course of the years like the house and all changed a, a good bit um um i suppose for me when i came back a lot of the people now when i came back i came back in my 30s 
so a lot of the people who I would have known were either getting married or were having children and um, they you know they're obviously all in school now and I'm starting to slowly get to know their children now um, I, I trained the under 10 camogie team um, along with a group of very dedicated uh, um, parents and, and volunteers as well but we're, we're all I still find now it's I think this is my third year of training um, with them and I'm still finding that I'm figuring out who's the older and who's the younger girls on the team because I wouldn't have um, I have no children myself I've no, so obviously I don't have them in, in the school as such so whereas some of the other coaches know immediately oh yeah she's she's in that person's class so that means she's this age or whatever so things like that um, but uh, yeah just still like um, Harlan and Camogie are still still hugely important um, community is hugely important now um, that How I wouldn't would have appreciated the, um, the community in the area actually um, I suppose now I'm starting to realise that there is a massive community there that's much bigger than I had seen or appreciated before. Um, like I would have, I would have been very much aware of people I spent my time with because you know that's who you spend your time with. Whereas now I'm, I'm around people that I maybe wouldn't have known as I was growing up, or I'm learning about things that would have happened between you know when I went off to college and when I came back again and people who've moved into the area or even people who've always been in the area who you know even people within my own family that are extended family that have done things that I wouldn't have you know been maybe been that interested in or been aware of at the time and they're just amazing to me like when I think about them now and I see you know what was done or what people achieved and everything um there's a lot of people who've moved into the area um, who have wildly different interests from say Camogie or from Harlan um, or from music um, I think what's um, very evident to me at the moment is that there's a huge community spirit in Ratnior I've always kind of known that but I've really come to really see it and feel part of it over the last number of years and there's a huge um, volunteer kind of a community aspect like and no matter what's been fundraised raised for Ratnior people are very very generous um either with their time or with you know whatever donations they can make I think the community looks after each other quite well um I think we're starting to become aware that you know maybe older people in the community aren't as involved as they would have been before COVID and we're, we're I think certainly people of my age are maybe starting to think about how can we involve them a little bit more or how can we learn from them I suppose um, but yeah it's it's a very diverse community and there's an awful lot of interests in the community that I suppose now we're starting to see or certainly I'm starting to see that I wouldn't have seen before okay. yeah um, just wanted to touch on the idea of kind of place and place identity and thinking yeah. about particularly about the, maybe the period when where you were um where you were away how would you have how would you describe if someone asked you where are you from how, how what, what would you have said i would have always said i'm from ratnior um from ratnior county wexford where is that it's kind of at the foot of the black stairs um i would have said it was a very big harlan um community um the mountain would have been very much um, a part of how we described it um, I suppose you know you're starting to when people don't know it or when they can't picture it you try and describe it to people and you you find yourself talking about things like um, Kelly from Clan or the Rackard Brothers and you know they've heard of Kelly from Clan or they've heard of 1798 and the fact that it was in you know Vinegar Hill and, and Clan and you know you um, I studied um, history in college and it was certainly a way for me to I suppose 
yeah it is a sense of place like try and place myself in that history like by saying oh yeah that was that was actually you know three miles away from where i grew up that's where um you know kelly was from and where the 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 pikes were forged and you know all of this kind of stuff i think it comes down to a connection like you try and connect yourself and even when you're far away from it and you're you're meeting people who are maybe irish but you know you're you're in america or you're in you know some other place in the world and you're you you try and find a connection so i think for me the sense of place was always how i connected myself to it and it was certainly music hurling um the mountain um history um yeah that's probably a big part of it you know my my parents would have been my mom especially was a a a big reader like she would have read an awful lot and like we would have we would have always been encouraged to read and to learn and like I suppose to to some degree it's it's maybe not the same because like when I grew up I would have grown up in the 80s and 90s um I'm probably more of an 80s child than a 90s child although I don't like admitting that but um I think um a lot of the things that were happening in society in Ireland at the time was people were questioning um and were kind of in, not really encouraged but i think people were finding that they could question things and i suppose my parents would have they would have always answered questions that we would have had for them we mightn't have asked them the questions that we really wanted to ask um until you know we were we were older or whatever but they never dictated to us what we ought to believe in or or anything like that but it's funny the the place or the the sense of community or anything like that it was never I never felt that was forced on me I think that came through a connection and through a, a an emotional attachment and a grounding in in the area that you're you know that I, I was raised in and that I was from so yeah I think I I still kind of think of of being at my my most at home I think when I am kind of at home or when I am still you know around Ratnior yes mm. um just wanted to ask about your your about cultural and natural heritage maybe mm. your your understanding of those terms and what they kind of bring to mind for you locally yeah. okay um for cultural heritage I suppose <laughs> it's it's I suppose it comes down to your understanding of the word cultural for me culture is it's not just um you know i suppose to some degree there's an idea that culture is to do with you know things like your history or things like society how society feels about something but i think culture is also to do with a collective thinking process and a collective um questioning and a collective way of talking about things or or you know assessing things or um understanding or how open you are towards something um one of the things like we recently the the there was a celebration probably celebration is the wrong word uh, uh, um commemoration. commemoration for um the 225th anniversary of 1798 it was held in Kalan. And one of the things that um, kind of stood out for me was the fact that people on both sides of the the divide, if you call it that, were were commemorated. You know, they're buried in the same graveyard. They came from the same community. Um, they came from the same location. Maybe not the same community because, in one respect, there was a difference in the community um, between the, between the two sides. But obviously, there was a huge interaction between those two. I suppose societies is the word rather than communities um um so for me cultural the the idea of a cultural identity is very much to do with the past and the present and also where you see the the future going or where you hope for the future to go and uh, what you're building towards for the future um heritage then heritage i think is more grounded in what has gone before you um, what you're inheriting in in one respect and also the value that you place on that like so whether it be something as simple as 
like um the values that are put on things in your childhood and and um you know whether that be camogie and hurling as I, I mentioned like that would be a huge part of my heritage I think but also another part of my heritage would be the mountain itself like and the fact that there's so many aspects of the mountain that I almost feel ownership of in one respect like frock and picking I'm I I'd say unless you've actually picked frockings on the mountain you haven't picked frockings like you know <laughs> it's a funny way of describing it but I, I think your heritage is probably more um it's it's more of a I don't want to say a built landscape but it's more of a a structured landscape I suppose if you want to call it that like there's there's geophysical side of it as well as there's there's you know historical actually built um man-made structures and stuff as well so I think that's the big difference I see between culture and heritage I suppose yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that actually leads me on kind of nicely to you, you mentioned kind of geophysics there and things about mm. geology you know the the um soil or rock types is that is that something yeah. that you would have been been aware of or kind of taken an interest in yeah very much so um my dad's a stonemason um my mom <laughs> loves her garden absolutely loves it like and um um loves actually the the act of gardening i think you know there's a great piece in 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 that i believe i i i think um dad would have <laughs> I have I've often thought I'd love to actually travel in the car with dad and just put a pin in a map every time he said I did that wall or we did that wall or we did that house up that laneway or something like that like he just seems to have had so much local um work as well as you know work throughout throughout Ireland but um very much so um there's like one of the things I suppose that I've I noticed when I came home, I moved home, actually home to my parents' house, um, just before COVID, and we I remember when the first lockdown happened, Dad and myself and Mum, we actually ended up cutting down a lot of the ash trees, um, around the house because they were all, um, they all had ash die back and they were starting to dangerously lean and stuff like that, so, you know. Um, those kind of things I suppose maybe not they're not geophysical as such but they are you know they do leave an impact on you but my um, below our house so actually on the the, the hill at Carrageen the lane that we live in is Carrageen or the small rock and it's basically a reference to the the stone that's that that particular hill is made from and it was quarried it was quarried for um from lime for limestone um and uh like over on the mountain um my dad often talks about it, the fact that you know he has he has rights on the mountain to actually take stone off the mountain it goes back hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years but it is a right that's still there um but the physical nature of like the mountain itself and the the rocks at the top of it and you know as i mentioned there's a big white white stone on the way up to it and Cahir's Den is a, a kind of a, a series of stones where you know legend has it that this this man Kaharua this highwayman um uh had a den there and he used to you know um carry out his his um his raids <laughs> and uh you know he he stole um a young girl and uh the farmers came up and buried him in in basically his his um his den which is what what you know we were told when we were younger i don't know if anybody actually knows where cahir's den is it seems to be a different place every time you go up the mountain and say oh no it's over here oh i thought it was over this side but um in general i think we all collectively agree it's in this area and it's kind of a very wide <laughs> reaching uh, stretch of of the landscape but um ratnur ratnur is actually named for rahanur Raz of the U3 so there's a huge number of Raz around Ratnur or there would have been or there there has been I should say um, many of them are are since knocked or cleared now but um, if you go back through some of the older maps um, you can see that there's certainly a lot more than there is at the moment um, so like 
you know you're talking about going back into many 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 generations and generations and generations of people um so there would have been a big community in Ratnur going back a long time and even how people say the word Ratnur it's like Ratanur but we don't say Ratanur we say Ranur so we don't even pronounce the you know the middle part of the word it's just Ranur and you know immediately when you're speaking to somebody whether they're from Ratnur or whether they're they're not from Ratnur you know it's it's just even how it's how it's talked about but um yeah I suppose that that's really like I mean when you think about it, then like there's there's like the built infrastructure like in the village itself like the church the belfry in 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 Ratnur, the old schoolhouse like Conran's like um uh, Monks Grange um you know there's so many and then into Kalan obviously with the records and and the 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 old monastery um, that was there and the old graveyard and the the Church of Ireland church and everything there there's there's such a um, there's such a history there and there's such each of them have had a huge impact on the landscape that they're built in but also on the people who built them or who have inherited them you know so yeah I suppose if you do think about it you could spend a lot of time you know caught up thinking about it but yeah, yeah yeah there's a lot in it is there um is there uh have you a favorite archaeological site within the area or um i suppose there, there's a few things like my my uncle pat his house is is literally built beside one of the biggest raz in I believe in Ireland, but I could be wrong on that. It's certainly one of the biggest in in Wexford. Um, it's one of the tallest. Has never been excavated. Um, I remember as a younger, as a young child, like playing in it. Um, I've always kind of been fascinated by Raz and seeing Raz and and you know learning the stories of them or whatever. Um, uh. Castle Boro um, is another place that has kind of always fascinated me. Um, probably because of the history there as well and the fact that it, you know, um, the fact that it was, I suppose, what it stood for in the community as well and, you know, how people felt about it at the time when it was burnt down and afterwards and even now talking about it now, like, you know, um, the, like there's so much of our history evident in the landscape around us like you know and you kind of pass by it sometimes without paying a whole lot of attention to it or seeing it um we had the pattern in Kalan just this past week and uh, the holy well there in Kalan I have many memories from childhood of going down the holy well going down to the holy well and taking a drink of water um don't know how really invested in you know the idea of a holy well we were but it was certainly something that had a cultural significance that we you know was done for generations before us and we did it um so i suppose the fact like even our own home uh, my parents home like in Carrigine, was a a small cottage that was you know built into a much bigger house um there's so many parts of the landscape that if you look at old maps now, like there was a laneway beside our house in Cargain that's not there. I don't think it was ever there when I was a child. Um, there's a there's a section of a wall in one of the fields below below our house where there's a, a almost like a is it called a souterrain? Like a an, it's almost like an entrance into a passage tomb. And it's not at all. It's like there's no passage to him or anything there. There's no, um, there's no indication that there was ever a um, a ra or anything like that. But just even how it was built, it was obviously some kind of a a way for moving livestock or something. Or you know, it had some significance to who built it. But it was built in a tradition that was very much we now see in the likes of Newgrange or places like that where you have a standing stone and, and maybe a stone from the roof of it jutting down as well so you can't walk straight through but you can kind of push yourself through it and 
Um, so I suppose I don't really have one significant um, yeah, site. There's a whole, there's, there's, a whole, whole, whole there's a whole lot of them. Yeah, yeah. 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 Is there a, yeah. is there a place that you like to bring visitors in the area, or if people ask for recommendations about things to see or visit or do locally, what what do you tell them? Oh gosh, um, I suppose like <laughs> they have to visit the Harlem Bridge, like they have to see a Harlem match. Um, it depends on what the visitor is coming for or what they're interested in like I would always bring people over the mountain if I could um, walk up the mountain a bit of the way or even if they're you know if we don't have time to actually climb part of it you know you certainly bring them up um, uh, Schlieff Bon up through the, 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 the forestry there and show them you know the meeting where you can see you know Carlow side and up into the counties um, north of Wexford and um, you can see all the way down to Ross Lair and everything. Um, I think, um, in terms of the music side of it, like if there was anything going on, you know, uh, there's, you know, every first Friday of every month there's a music session on in Connors. Um, there's music, um, records and Kalan has recently been refurbished and there's big plans for that as a music venue. So there's music plan for there as well. So um, probably Kalan and um you know the mountain and the village like you know in one respect you could travel and you could visit all of them in one day but you're not doing any of them any justice by doing that you know you really need to spend time and and have a wander and 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 go through it and see it there's there's lots of different things like um there's a section of the road between say monks grange and what i would call carty's cross um which other people have called Calan cross um uh, there was recently a, a plaque or a stone um, to commemorate the forge that was there for the 1798 um, for, uh, there was uh, pikes that were built in a forge there I think it's Kelly's Forge um, but there's a section of that road where there's a crooked bridge and on that crooked bridge my mam's father and his brother um, the bridge was being repaired at the time and they were on their way to school in Ratnior and they put their hands in the wet cement, in the wet mortar, uh, mortar probably wasn't cement at the time, in their wet mortar and like their handprints, we we found, her, you know, we saw the handprints there when, when we were small. That's only recently, only in the last, I'd say, f less than five years that has been repaired again and that's no longer there. Um, but you know things like that would have meaning to me and to my family and you know you I often find when I'm in the car with my nieces and nephews I'm telling them these things and you know they're they're somewhat interested but it's it's not really something that they're overly interested in because they don't have the idea of the the history side of it or how long the fact that you know you're talking about three generations from me so it'll be four generations from them that have been in the community that have been in this area you know that have lived here um and i certainly as a child didn't appreciate that i didn't realize that um so that's why i say when it's it depends on the visitor like if it's somebody who you know has a sense of place and understands the sense of place like we have you know if you had visitors from from abroad they maybe don't know the landscape or they haven't seen a landscape like ours before or you know and for them it's about you know taking taking trips on you know up the mountain where they can see much more of the landscape they have massive views um somebody who has an interest in you know history and um you you'd probably be more inclined to go to Kalan rather than Tratnior because the built um infrastructures are still there in Kalan in a way that they're not in Ratnior you know so like Ratnior and Kalan were kind of developed as parallel communities you know you had a kind of a Church of Ireland community and you had a, a Catholic community so you had two churches that were you know very much kind of in tandem I suppose in one respect but still separate but very much of the same community you know so um, yeah I think certainly I think there's there's many a day trip to be had <laughs> around right newer and around the area like yeah what about plants and animals or kind of biodiversity in the yeah in the area um 
it's not something I'm I'm probably reluctant to admit it to myself but it's probably not something that I would have paid an awful lot of attention to as I was growing up um it's only now when you realize that you don't have the names of things and those things are now gone you know I talked about the rushes that were missing because of the hedge cutting or you know the all the wildflowers like we had amazing wildflowers like that I don't see anymore um certainly there's there's a particular kind of yellow flower that I see on the mountain and I've only ever seen it down on the coast and I don't know if it grows anywhere else I don't know the name of it so I don't know how you know you're trying to describe it to somebody and you don't know if you're describing it the right way or whatever um but uh I I I suppose I I don't really have the the words because my interest wouldn't have been there it's something I suppose I'm much more becoming aware of now and you know um probably more of an interest is tweet is is you know peaked different times but it's not something that I actively go looking for probably um but I do think that it's a growing um interest and the more like it more the more taps into curiosity the more you'd kind of learn about it or you'd be interested in looking into it but it's you know there's there's other people in Ratnior who are much more um familiar and who are much more you know they've they've studied it and they've you know they've documented it um in a way that that I envy you know <laughs> so yeah yeah you, you mentioned frogs earlier and for, for frog picking would have been that was mm. kind of very much a part of your your childhood yeah yeah definitely um we'd <laughs> inevitably on some summer school holiday day of the week or on a Sunday or whatever we'd tell mommy we're going frog and picking and mommy would say okay um known full well we'll come back with no frockings like and you know evident of having picked lots of frockings but none of them would be in the you know you'd be ticking you'd be doing well if you can come back with the bottom of whatever lunch box or you know plastic beaker or whatever you brought with you had you know a layer of frockings on it but they're just too <laughs> they're too appealing you can't stop eating them um but where like from from our house at the tea of Cardine over to the mountain like there was frockings growing along all the ditches you know so by the time we got to the mountain we were already you know fully full of frockings so you go on to the mountain then you'd be picking a few and you know you'd be you'd have them full up maybe on uh, but by the time you got back down off the mountain then you'd be eating them again and they'd be gone by the time you got home you know so it was never we had all great plans we're gonna make frock and jam we never made frock and jam never ever made it because we never came home with enough to make it like you know but there's there's something uniquely special about a frock and it tastes like no other berry you know and you're trying to describe it to people and you say it's kind of like a blueberry but smaller than a blueberry but it's not the same as a blueberry you know but i think blueberries are probably the one that most people would recognize as the type of berry it is like yeah can we touch a little bit on um on um tourism um mm. just thinking and, and maybe it, it links into what we were we were um discussing earlier but how would you describe the the ideal visitor to the area or what um what would you kind of like to see if, if in terms of um the characteristics of a of a tourist gosh um i think a tourist would be somebody who doesn't just come for a day you know an ideal tourist would be somebody who'd stay you know for a, a few days in the area you know and they'd it wouldn't be just you know kind of a quick run up the mountain like to see the mountain rather than to you know to climb it or to to really spend time on it or yeah I suppose it's somebody who'd be around who'd actually get to talk to people and know people and maybe come to appreciate the history and the the generations of people who've lived in Ratnior and Killahan excuse me in the area um I suppose definitely have to have some kind of an interest in the outdoors um whether that be in sport or whether it be you know actually 
you know spending time on the mountain um or as you say anybody who's interested in uh you know the flora and fauna that's a huge i think there's a huge potential there for for um an ecological type of tourist um to spend a bit of time in in Ratnure in the area like the black stairs part of the black stairs is is a um deemed to be a, an area of special conservation so um you know there is certainly it's recognized as an area where there's huge um uh, diversity in that respect um yeah sport like there i mean there's so many options between you know there's so much history in the community and there's so much um there's so much uh stories in it and you know music is such a big part of it and storytelling is such a big part of it um but i think it's actually the talking to people and the the connections and drawing it out um i think that's that's what i'd like to see i'd like to see somebody who can appreciate that side of it um maybe more than say somebody who's coming to look at a pretty view or something like that you know that it's actually um it's it's tapping into the cu the curiosity of the community as well as you know appreciating as i say a view or a, a landscape or you know passing passing by a monument and kind of stopping off for a selfie kind of thing you know so one yeah. of the kind of challenges um associated with tourism or associated with kind of developing tourism in the area um i think even defining it <laughs> it's a big thing um but i think probably a big side of it is like in one respect when people think of tourism they think of tourism as a short window it's a short season um and you know it has to be fine weather and it has to be you know it's prescribed it has to do this and then they have to do that and they have a certain amount of time here and a certain amount of time there so i think one of the biggest challenges is as a community understanding what we have and appreciating what we have and then translating that or describing that or showing that in a way that appeals to much more than a surface level to people um so that you're i know there's a, a, a like um it's like living like a local is is this idea of or this you know um development in tourism at the minute that you're actually living as the community live but i do think that's that's a huge part of it because i think in if you can appreciate how people live you're also not taken from how those people live so you're not seeing as other um by the community that's there you know so it becomes part of the normal every day uh or not becomes part of it it's just integrated into the normal every day that's there already um i think um for uh another challenge i suppose is um like certainly in terms of say ratnior at the minute um and Kalan, um like there's nowhere for for tourists to stay like we don't have accommodation it's not something that we have you know um developed as a an industry um we also maybe don't have formalized tourist destinations like you know it's something we're probably only becoming aware of now that is um i think covid in one respect and the fact that people did a lot of staycations and they started asking questions or they maybe started tapping into areas where they remembered from their own childhoods um or they you know they've had family who have migrated out of the area and they're coming back to find where their parents were from or where they're grandparents are from or something like that like all of those kind of things where they're questioning or where they're asking for information or they're looking back it makes you appreciate or not even appreciate but it makes you even realize what what you have like or, or what people you know i talked about a sense you know we talked about a sense of place and like i feel very much part of ratnure um it's my sense of place because like my parents grew up there my grandparents grew up there so i feel very much rooted in ratnure but i can't imagine what it would be like for somebody whose par grandparents grew up somewhere else and they had to travel somewhere for you know for a job or for 
better opportunities or whatever it was and they don't have that same connection to where they are now you know so um i think if we can show people that the connection is still there and that it's worthwhile maintaining and that the community is not gone away like that sense of community is still there and that they're part of that community even if they're not living in the area every day you know what's the best thing about living in the area uh, I suppose for me it's the fact that so many of my family are living there you know it's very much a, a local you know I feel like you could say that like all of my my nieces and nephews um, are living in Wexford in County Wexford um, my I have one sister who's who has been living in America and um, her children are her, her stepchildren I suppose I don't like that term but in effect that's what they are um, you know her husband Shay had children before they got married and like I don't know them the same way as I'd know my nieces and nephews um, so for me it's the sense of place and it's the sense of um, my family there um, but there's also like a lot of my interests are um, served if you want to call it that in Ratnior like you know you have the GA you have the Camogie you have you know music you have um, like there's a we have a development group in Ratnior at the moment who are uh, we're working towards um, you know creating a community space um, that benefits much more of the community than um, say that has already been served very well through the Harlem Club or through the Camogie Club um, so if we can um, you know develop an area for younger children or people who have no interest in sport like who are interested in you know um, music or art or um, uh, creative things like or you know we, we don't have a small dedicated space in Ratnior like that could be open for you know an audiovisual you know an, an evening you know looking at a movie or you know somebody to come in and do a talk or um, you know uh, you know we've said, when I think about it like there's so much there's so many people who have originated from the community who have or who have connections with the community who have um, led these amazing lives like and we don't know about them and it would be I'm sure there's an interest there for people that if they were to come back and you know they had somewhere that they could do like a little audio visual show or they could put on a, a a small play or one person play or you know a, a music event or even somewhere for young people to practice music for like when 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 I was growing up like my brothers were in bands my sister was in a band we were in orchestras or whatever but you know they were all none of those were there was no dedicated space for everybody to come and, and practice like you know um uh, unless it was as was happened in our house like the, you went into the garage and there was a kind of a room converted there or whatever but there was no you know there's no space that you could rent out for a couple of hours and, and practice that way now if you went looking for it you know you could do it in the hall or something like that but it's not it's not a, a dedicated space you know so I think something like that would be um, something that I certainly would like to see developed a little bit in Ratignore you know you might have actually answered my next question in the in the last part there, but yeah. just in, in case something else comes to mind. Mm. Um, what's the thing you'd most like to change about the area? Um, I think Ratnior um, has been very, very good. Like the Harlan Club and the Camogie Club have been very, very good for the community. I'd love to see more interests that are in the community nurtured a little bit more by having a space for them. Um, I'd also, I suppose in one respect, like to see, like I think in terms of the village itself, I think it's quite manicured. <laughs> it's quite, um, you know, there's, you know, if you think of trees and things like that, like they're, 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 maintained I suppose if you want to call it that but I'd like to see it kind of going back a little bit to what I remember like you know the, the big hedgerows where there's a lot of diversity and um, uh, 
plants, I suppose, and also animals and stuff like that. Um, I'd love to see the mass paths uh, um, reinvigorated, like, because uh, um, I just think that it's a lovely idea to have somewhere to walk that's off the roads, um, not necessarily around, like we do have a fantastic um, uh, walking track around the Harland Club, but I know there's people in the community who are maybe either not aware that the walking track is there in the first place or who are a little bit intimidated going into the, the hurling club because they're not hurlers or they're not part of a hurling um, environment I suppose you know they've no interest in it or they've never had an interest in it and uh, I would like to see those kind of interests like there's a huge number of crafters in Ratnior like there's a huge number of of people like my mom included like who are quilters or embroiderers or um you know um very creative and uh, thoughtful um people um who i don't believe are are served very well by a community structure you know um and i'd like to see that probably changed a little bit yeah what challenges do you think the area face in the short and long term um I think like I said there's a huge volunteer um there's a strength in the community for um it's very volunteer led um they're very generous with their time and and money when you know when things like that are 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 there I think um engagement is a big thing like how to keep people engaged and how to keep people interested um, a lot of people like to be involved but I think communication is a major uh, thing for keeping communities um, engaged with development and with with each other you know um, for example I was talking with uh, uh, somebody recently in Calan about their you know the commemorations for the 1798 uh, 225th anniversary and um they were saying that uh, they literally went and knocked on people's doors to let them know about it and to actually invite them to come to the commemoration and it meant so much to people to be invited and I think that is something that I don't know if it's a challenge is the right word but it's certainly something that I don't think well certainly I realised I, I think as a community maybe we didn't realise we just kind of assumed that because you're involved and because you're aware of it and the people that you're talking to are aware of it that there's others who aren't aware and it's getting word out and getting people interested and making them uh not making them that sounds really like you're beating them over the head with it but i mean like for them to feel ownership of something in the community and to feel involved and to feel part of the community um especially after covid and i think older people like our for example we had a um a senior citizens kind of a club um active retirement if i say the right name for it active retirement um group in ratnior very very involved um i had an awful lot of people who were coming on a regular basis that hasn't um it hasn't come back after covid and it's something i know we've picked up on now and we're saying okay how can we bring this back so that people have somewhere to come on a regular basis you know that there's people who are maybe lonely but are maybe whether it's because they've become conditioned to stay at home over COVID or because they've no means of getting to wherever it is that, you know, these community things are happening. But I think we need, one of the challenges is definitely getting people back out and getting people back into a community um, setting where, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a group thing rather than individuals, you know. Is there anything um, that I haven't asked you about, Karen, that you wanted to mention before we finish? Um, no, I don't think so. <laughs> I think we've done a, a, a fairly wide ranging amount of stuff there. Um, no, I don't think so. I think that's pretty much it. That's great. Thanks, Thanks for the recording. Thanks very much. Okay. No bother.